Okay, this screencast covers a very detailed topic. This is part one of the screencast. The topic is cosmology. Cosmology is a study of the origin, evolution, and fate of the universe. Now, with respect to addressing the universe as a whole, how can you actually move from just merely speculating philosophically to an exact science? Well, with respect to cosmology becoming an exact science, what is referred to as Olber's paradox, which was first proposed in 1823, provides a clue. Olber's paradox basically asks the following. Why is the night sky dark? So, for example, let's say that the universe is infinitely large. If the universe is infinitely large, what that would then mean is that if you look in any direction, eventually your line of sight would fall on the surface of a star. And if the universe is infinitely large and correspondingly infinitely old, this would then mean that eventually light from that star would reach your eye. So then therefore, if the universe was infinitely large and infinitely old, if you looked in every single direction, you would then eventually have your line of sight fall onto the surface of a star. So then therefore, the sky should be extremely bright. But it's not. When we look out into the universe, the night sky, for example, it's dark. So therefore, this immediately implies that the universe itself has to be of finite size and of finite age. Okay, the story of cosmology in the modern sense actually really begins with Isaac Newton in Principia in 1687, where he used the law of universal gravitation to unify together motion near the surface of the Earth and motion in the heavens with respect to planetary motion as the same thing, that is, gravity. And then if essentially, if the publication of Principia represents the birth of modern science. Ever since that time, basically, science has been leading us into a very specific direction, eventually discovering the laws of nature and perhaps one final theory of nature that could be used to explain everything. That's one of the goals of this screencast is to ultimately arrive at that explanation. You know, with respect to this process of unification, as it's called in physics, the next big event in unification happened with the work of James Clerk Maxwell in the 19th century. Maxwell unifies together electricity and magnetism through four expressions. These mathematical equations are referred to as Maxwell's equations, and it is our mathematical explanation of the fundamental force of electromagnetism. Maxwell's equations perfectly explain all electromagnetic phenomena and their application. Okay, next we get to Albert Einstein. Okay, Albert Einstein develops general relativity in 1916. That's our current understanding of gravity. Now, general relativity makes some startling predictions about the universe as a whole. It actually predicts mathematically that the universe expands, and it expands with no center. Now, how could you picture the expansion of a universe with no center? Well, I provide for you a demonstration in the folder for today that depicts that. So at this point, go ahead and pause this screencast and take a look at that demonstration. Okay, now that you've seen that demonstration in terms of visualizing the expansion of the universe where the universe has no center, once again, this is mathematically predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. Let me now give you the basic history behind this in the 1920s. Okay, Einstein himself actually did not make this mathematical prediction from general relativity. It was actually more or less pointed out to him by another physicist, this gentleman here, named George Lemaitre. Lemaitre used the Einstein field equation to show that the Einstein field equation itself actually predicts an expanding universe. The irony of, of all of this, however, is that Einstein himself actually refused to believe his own theory. His theory made a mathematical prediction about an expanding universe, and he refused to believe it. So because of that, what Einstein actually did in the field equation is he introduced into the equation a fudge factor, basically a fudge factor called the cosmological constant that would prevent the universe from expanding. He did this basically artificially. He didn't like the idea of an expanding universe. For whatever reason, he disagreed with it philosophically. So he basically fudged his own theory to prevent it from happening. Later on, Einstein referred to the cosmological constant as the biggest mis mistake that he ever made in his professional career. Hey, Lemaitre, at any rate, proposes then in 1927 the beginnings of the Big Bang Theory. He proposes what is called the primeval fireball. The primeval fireball is the idea that if you take the expanding universe as it is right now and kind of like run it backwards as a movie, 
eventually you're going to reach a point where everything in the entire universe is at a point, an extremely hot, dense point, if you will, that is referred to as the primeval fireball. And then for reasons unknown, the universe expanded and cooled from that extremely hot, dense initial point. Eventually, of course, this begins the process of developing the Big Bang Theory of Cosmology, which we'll get to as we proceed. Okay, and then still in the 1920s, we have the observations made by the American astronomer Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble, one of the reasons why he's so famous is because he discovered that the universe, in fact, is expanding. He made these discoveries at Mount Wilson Observatory, which is in just north of Pasadena here in Southern California. Hubble discovered what is referred to as Hubble's Law. The further that we look out into the universe, the faster that we see galaxies recede from us. Essentially, what Hubble made regarding galaxies are two crucial measurements. First of all is the easy measurement. The easy measurement to make is how fast, away from us or towards us, an individual galaxy is moving. In order to make this measurement, we make use of what is called a redshift or a blue shift. An object that is moving towards you, for example, and is emitting light as it does, well, the light that it emits towards you gets compressed a little bit. In other words, the wavelength is a little bit smaller than it would be if instead the object was stationary. This is referred to as a blue shift because the light is shifted towards the blue portion of the spectrum. If you have an object that is moving away from you, however, and emit light towards you, then that light is stretched out a little bit. This then results in a slightly longer wavelength and referred to as a red shift. The light is shifted to the spectrum. The amount of redshift associated with an object moving away from you, for example, corresponds to how quickly it's moving away from you. The redshift for a galaxy is actually relatively easy to measure. The hard thing to measure, however, is how far is a galaxy from you. I'm not going to get into that here in this screencast because that's a detailed topic all by itself, but it is a difficult measurement to make. Over the last century or so, astronomers have become very good at coming up with ways, mathematically, of measuring the distances to various objects. The Hubble basically collected all this data, that is, how fast a galaxy is moving away from us and how far a galaxy is from us, as he made his observations of individual galaxies using the telescope north of Pasadena in the 1920s. When he amassed this data, he then plotted the following graph. He plotted the velocity of the galaxy moving away from us as a function of its distance from us. And lo and behold, what you end up with here is a straight line. The slope of this line describes the rate of expansion of the universe itself in terms of kilometers per second divided by what is referred to as a megaparsec. A megaparsec is a unit of distance. It's about 3.6 million light years. The slope of this line describes then basically the rate of the expansion of the universe. If you, however, take the reciprocal of the slope of this line, then the units work out to be the following. You take distance here and divide it by distance over time. When you do, you end up with a time. The time is the age of the universe. In other words, how long it was back in the past when we had the initial point of expansion, the hypothetical primeval fireball, of George Lemaitre. Using the current measurements that we have made extensively over the course of the last few decades, right now, based upon what is called the Hubble constant, the slope of this line, the age of the universe is about 13.8 billion years. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and pause this screencast here.